folks, the technology just keeps on getting better. The wearables and the gadgets keep on multiplying and the big data just keeps on getting bigger. So what is the future of you? What's the future of the endurance athlete? It's the future of me, the endurance coach. I don't know, honestly. It's something that I think about daily or all the time, let's just say. And uh, even though I have kind of my vision of where I think all of this going and this where this industry is going, I figured I'd turn to some of the the experts, the people who have been kind of you know the the founders of of a lot of this technology and how we do what we do in coaching and in athletics. So Dirk Friel, who's a co-founder at Training Peaks and chief evangelist over there, uh, reached out to him and I said, "Hey, I got this idea uh, about the future of the endurance athlete." for the train right podcast would you like to come on and he said of course sure let's let's do it uh meanwhile he wrangled ryan cooper who is uh the founder of best bike split um who's a super nerd uh engineer over at training peaks and a lovely human being and we got them both on on the interview and it turned out really good so i think for anybody who regularly tunes into this um to this podcast i think you'll love this i I think you'll you get to hear the story of training peaks how it got started which is um a wonderful story that dirk shares and then you'll also as as ryan um alludes to there's some really cool stuff coming out of this company and in in this industry so uh thank you all for coming back to the train right podcast there's more great episodes coming for now Enjoy the future of the endurance athlete. How we capture, monitor, and store our data as endurance athletes is more important now than ever before. I've spoken about this in shows past, but today we're going to explore why this is, where the endurance athlete and coach are going, and what you, the listener, can do if you want to capitalize on the advancements in technology, AI, and the services that future forward companies like Training Peaks are developing. We have two distinguished guests today on our show, Dirk Friel and Ryan Cooper. Gentlemen, welcome to the Train Art Podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, and, and could you introduce yourselves a bit more to our audience? And, and Dirk, I'll just queue it up with you first. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm a co-founder of Training Peaks. Um, I really haven't ever had any other job unless you count pizza delivery and working at a health club front desk in high school. <laughs> um, so nice. this is kind of uh, what I dreamed of doing the rest of my life, you know, from age 12 on more or less, ha- you know, having something to do with cycling. I didn't want to sell bikes, um, but somehow I found my way into coaching, luckily with my father, Joe Friel in the family business. And then that led to an idea I had in 99, 1999 to uh, start this web-based uh, Training Peaks project. So that's, that's and I'm chief evangelist. I've held almost every role in the business except um, being an actual software engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, we're, we're going to get into that a little bit more because there's some really fun stories that I've heard iterations of at various conferences and happy hours throughout the years. Yeah. Uh, and, and I want to tell that story a bit more, but um, until we do that, Ryan, could you introduce yourself a, a bit more to our audience? Sure. Uh, I'm, I guess the opposite of Dirk, I've had a lot of jobs um, and <laughs> ranging, ranging the gamut from uh, started off as an engineer. Uh, so electrical engineer, not a, not a software engineer. Um, and, and worked in the aerospace industry and, and a few other industries, um, did a couple of startups. And at one of these, uh, I, I was trying to pursue my PhD. Um, and, and I was also trying to train as a triathlete. And I noticed that I was, I was just juggling all these things at the same time. And, and that really got me excited about um, kind of trying to focus my attention job wise in, into the endurance space. And so out of that came, uh, what became best bike split. And we were fortunate enough to, <laughs> this is a little story, but we were fortunate enough to, um, accidentally use some, uh, some training peaks IP in our application. 
and got a got a kind of a not a nasty gram, but but Gear Fisher sent us a a message <laughs> saying, "Hey, by the way, uh, you're using some Training Peaks IP, and why don't you give me a call?" So uh, we were using normalized power in TSS. So I I, I gave him a call. And he said, "Hey, um, don't worry about it. You just have to make sure you uh, do some attribution to to Training Peaks. But would you guys like to to fly up here and 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 talk with us?" And um, five months later, uh, we were part of Training Peaks, and so <laughs> that was my my Training Peaks uh, journey, or my journey to get to Training Peaks, and uh, and it's been it's been amazing ever since. So um, at Training Peaks, we we have the best bike split brand. Uh, but I'm also taking a larger role uh, through R and D and through some of our new uh, new initiatives as a chief scientist at Training Peaks. <laughs> That's really cool. I I did not know that that is how it all came to be, Ryan. So I love it. I love it. Well, as as our listeners can tell, we have some some uh, heavy hitters here in the space of technology, AI, and in all things training. And we'll get into the ooey gooey good details of that here in just a few minutes, but I, I want to understand more and, and have you, the listeners, understand that there's a lot more going on under the umbrella than only Training Peaks. There's multiple companies, the people that run them, and a vision that has helped to rapidly evolve given the times and give the end users a product that they can do uh, what they do better, be it swim, bike, run, lift, play, learn, but kind of getting our head or, ahead of ourselves, so to speak right now. So let's set the stage for that. And, and Dirk, you're going to be the best one to do that. Could you tell us more what Peaksware is and, and how it operates? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Peaksware is our umbrella company. Um, we've got four main brands within Peaksware. Training Peaks is the original. Um, and Peaksware really came about in a, around 2007. Um, Andy Stevens joined as our chairman um, and investor in Training Peaks in 2007. Um, and he started to kind of craft a, a bigger vision for the company. He loved you know, what we were doing at Training Peaks, really connecting expert coaches with, with athletes and helping them train for their events. But that same model can be leveraged and used in, in other domains. And he saw that. Um, and one of the first where he saw opportunity was in uh, music education. So we have two brands within music, and that's Make Music. And the, the main um, application there that's sold in K through 12 schools is called Smart Music. And then we have Alfred Publishing. And so Alfred really is kind of the number one in terms of music ed content. Um, if you have any, anyone's played the the violin for example you might know suzuki method um we own the the uh, worldwide rights except for japan for suzuki and all their content so we with alfred we, we, it's more about creating educational content and then bringing it to the masses through smart music and through the apps at smart music and into the kids hands and and and, and um, teachers jobs um can rely on it just like a triathlon coach can rely on training peaks to manage their athletes. Our music products do the very same thing. They help students learn a new skill, which is music, preparing for an event, which is actually their concerts. Um, and so it's all very parallel with athletics. We have another product within athletics and that or fitness, and that's Train Heroic. And Train Heroic is the same model as Training Peaks. We really service uh, strength and conditioning coaches. Um, in performance team sports. We have NFL, NBA, hockey, rugby, collegiate high school teams on Train Heroic. And it's really meant to make the life of the strength coach um, easier, better. Um, they can manage the entire team's um, you know, strength training programs through Train Heroic. Um, obviously we have best bike split, which we've, we've mentioned and, and Ryan is a founder of best bike split. And we also have WKO, WKO five, which is our desktop analysis software. So, uh, we have quite a few brands under the Peaksware umbrella. Uh, we don't really promote Peaksware per se. That's really a, a business holdings, um, company, but the, the roots and the vision for everything really kind of stems from training peaks and all the the marketplace that we have and how we connect athletes and coaches. And instead of saying teachers and coaches, we say experts. And instead of saying 
athletes and students, um, we say, you know, the performer, for example. So that's kind of in a nutshell what Pe- Peak Square is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes that makes sense. And having it all laid out there kind of like for the first time, I think for me, um, that's that's good to hear. I was reading a book a while back, one of my favorite books now. Um, it's called Peak by Anders Ericsson. Mm-hmm. It talks a lot about deliberate practice. And you've spoken at multiple conferences um, about how you, you know, wrap that ethos into what you guys do at Training Peaks. Could you speak a little bit more on, in terms of how you use deliberate practice uh, within the organization? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is at the heart of what we do. Every single person in the business understands the importance of deliberate practice, how we connect um, experts with performers. Um, and so uh, Anders is kind of uh, really a special guy in our world. Obviously, he's kind of the, the father, if you will, of deliberate practice. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of his research was maybe misconstrued and the mm-hmm. 10,000 hour rule came out. <laughs> kind of came from that, but he didn't, he did not create the 10,000 hour rule. Um, and in fact, hours don't really directly re- relate, you know, it's more about the purposeful practice. And so when we think deliberate practice, you know, first setting a specific goal, getting expert instruction, doing this purposeful or focused practice, and then getting immediate feedback. And so with all of our technology and our brands, we kind of, we can map all of our solutions and all of our feature sets to those four quadrants within um, deliberate practice. And so, you know, and a, and a big one is definitely that expert instruction um, quadrant, you know, getting connected with an experienced qualified coach. You can go out and ride your bike and swim and run all you want on your own with no purpose, no instruction, and you can do 10,000 hours and, you know, you may be slightly better, (laughs) Um, but if you put those 10,000 hours, you know, against expert instruction, focus practice, um, you know, the expert eye, you know, that coach that can see, oh, we really need to work on this particular skill or you're weak in this area of your racing. Let's focus on whatever it might be, Um, you, you know, your weakness as it relates to your goal. So absolutely. And, and, you know, sorry to say Anders actually passed away about two months ago. Um, yeah, and that was that's sad. yeah, we had the actual p- privilege of having him attend one of our offsites. We had a executive, oh, um, manager, um, retreat up in Jackson hole a couple of years ago. And we flew in Anders Ericsson, um, to speak. He spent two days with us and kind of going through his theory and thought, and it really kind of opened our eyes, um, to the kind of broader mission that we have within Peaksware. Wow. Wow. That's, that's special. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Um, well, you know, so taking all that information and, and kind of starting with training peaks, Dirk, could you kind of tell the story of how training peaks started and also describe what it is for maybe, maybe some of our listeners who are, are not users of training peaks and, uh, or don't know about it. Sure. You know, the reason we started Training Peaks was so we can deliver better quality service to our athletes. I was, as I mentioned earlier in my intro, I was coaching with my father, uh, Joe Friel, and I started coaching with him in about 1997, towards the end of my pro cycling career. And it come to find out, you know, he was relying on email attachments and fax machines to actually manage all this, um, you know, crazy amount of data. And towards the end of the nineties, we started to get the, you know, heart rate files, you know, dot HRM files. We were getting dot CSV files from PowerTap, dot SRM files from SRM. Every, every different device had its own proprietary kind of piece of desktop software. So with, you know, the 15 athletes I was working with, I might have, you know, four different app- applications open, plus maybe, a, a, you know, some fax paper that I'm three hole punching. And you just quickly, you can tell how inefficient all that was. Uh, and it's the late nineties dot com era. So I was like, Hey dad, you know, we can probably, you know, do better by our clients and ourselves. Um, if we had a web-based system, um, neither of us were programmers, 
And we just sort of just had this vision. And luckily, the best man in my wedding, Gear Fisher, was a web developer. He's the only kind of uh, engineer I knew of. <laughs> and I just knew he developed web pages, you know. And um, so I, he was living up near Vail, Colorado at the time. And I went up in, uh, it's like September 1999. Uh, took him out to a bar, of course, over a beer and pitched him on my idea. And luckily, he he bought it and he he totally understood where, where we were coming from and how a web-based scheduling um, calendar or training log system could really benefit, you know, us as coaches, as well as our athletes. Mm -hmm. He had read all of my father's books, you know, the cyclist training Bible, triathletes training Bible, et cetera. So he kind of knew the system and, and everything from annual training plan all the way down to today's workout and how much, how much did you weigh this morning, you know, and how important all that is collectively. Um, so we kind of stayed up late at night, um, many nights and actually by, it was about March of 2000, we were actually managing about 30 athletes through those, this web-based system and gear had the idea that, Hey, no other coach on the planet has such a, a system. Let's see if other coaches would, would like to use it. And, um, you know, all of a sudden we started making revenue um, through this software application that we had, but yet we were a coaching business and we had no intent of creating a software business, but it was just a void that, that we, that we filled and other coaches started coming to us. So, um, by late 2000, we split the books, split the bank accounts, created a separate LLC. And from that day forward, I spent more and more time on the software side of things and less and less time coaching. Um, and I, I, you know, I definitely knew a, a lot of coaches. Uh, my father had a big name in the industry. And then we had a technologist in Gear Fisher. So it was a really nice um, pairing of the three co-founders. And that's how it started. And really from day one until today, it's, it's doing the very same thing. It's connecting coaches and athletes, helping athletes um, train for their events, get better at what they love to do. And we make the coaches' lives simpler. Um, so yeah, that's how, how it really started. Yeah, no, that's that's an awesome story, and the the, the trifecta of you three uh, getting it done early on, and all started over <laughs> for a beer in a bar. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so any athlete can use Training Peaks, right? And there's a there's a free version and a paid version, right? Yeah, you know, we really built the business early on on the backs of of triathletes. You know, triathlon was a, a, a very gotcha. rapidly growing sport. Um, events, Ironman, all that was, in a, you know, certainly really gaining a lot of traction and we owe a lot to that movement and we owe a lot to the, you know, visionary, um, I guess, um, the, you know, the way that coaching developed and grew as a, as a career path for triathletes also mm -hmm. was very important to our development. Um, but now really any endurance athlete is turning to training peaks. And as CTS probably knows as well, you know, you guys, I believe coach, you know, a lot of mountain climbers, you know, um, we've got people trying to reach the top of Mount Everest, um, big adventures. Yeah. Um, yeah. so if, if, if anyone cares about time distance, GPS plus heart rate, you know, then they're a prime candidate. And if they have an event on the calendar, um, and that event doesn't have to actually have a start line, you know, climbing Mount Everest, doing a bike packing trip. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things people are training for these days that actually aren't organized events per se traditionally. Um, but it is a big goal that they have and they need expert instruction to help them achieve that. So we've certainly tra attracted all types of endurance athletes. Um, and, but problem, you know, certainly our bread and butter is cycling triathlon and, and running still. Yeah. And even in, I've had some people come to me and even ask it's, you know, if they were, if they're not ready to get a coach, can I just start 
you know, uploading my, my run data to training peaks and, and even like some sleep stuff and some, uh, some other metrics. And it does a really good job of just organizing so that if you do want to get more serious, you can, or if you just want to kind of keep it organized, um, and keep it a little bit more casual, you, you can yeah. as well. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no barrier to entry, you know, there's all kinds of different apps out there that where you can start tracking. I think one thing that we're, where we're unique is we're compatible with so many different, I think it's maybe 300 plus different apps and devices out there now, everything from the whoop strap, you know, to the latest power meter, you know, and everything in between as well as nutrition, you know, my fitness pal and, and others, you know, you can upload, um, macronutrients, you know, into the system. So, um, and you can do all that for free. And then, um, when you are ready for getting a training plan or a coach, we're certainly here to help make that connection. And is just off the, off the cuff here, Dirk, is there any file extension that you guys cannot handle right now? <laughs> oh, certainly. <laughs> I think with the proliferation of dot fit, however, Ryan can probably speak to this, you know, dot fit has kind of taken over the world with, you know, Garmin and everybody else. And it's just become so easy now syncing Bluetooth to your phone and then up to the cloud and then it's tr all hand handled there. So that was a, a big, big, big hurdle that we had to take on throughout our development, just trying to convince athletes to download whatever file type it was. And then to go through this horrible, ugly process of manually uploading it, you know, to trainingpeaks.com, that was a, a big chunk of our time um, was convincing athletes to do that. Now it's just ubiquitous. It's just kind of like common. Everybody does that no matter what level of athlete you're, you are. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's right. That's right. And in Ryan, um, you know, we, we kind of heard your story of how you got acquired by training peaks. Uh, but throughout this journey too, I mean, Dirk and Ryan both, I mean, you don't just start this company and then all of a sudden it's up and running and, and you're rocking and rolling. I mean, there's, there's probably been a lot of experimentation, a lot of, uh, a lot of success, a lot of failure along the way. So Ryan, can you talk a little bit about where Training Peaks has experimented, where it went sideways and, and maybe when it really connected? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't want to say sideways, but it, it's kind of an interesting, especially with Dirk on the line. Uh, but no, there, there's kind of an interesting question or point you, you brought up about the the file process, right? So yeah. Um, in recent years, the this explosion of dot fit files, it, it's kind of the de facto standard in, in the fitness industry. Um, and because of that, they, they started to expand that file structure um, to allow for, for new types of data, new types of fields. Um, but it's it's a standard, but the the this like new these new fields are not standardized. So um, one thing that we've done to kind of mitigate that, I think, is is WKO5 can read all of those non-standard data fields, and you can still manipulate them and still use them uh, within within that platform. But until they become kind of a more standardized format, then they're they're not going to be able to to, to be pulled into Training Peaks. Uh, so, for an example, um, about a year ago, they started you started to see these. Um, Aero sensors uh, out in in the world, mm -hmm. so there are several different variants of it. I have one on my desk actually. Um, <laughs> in in the whole goal of that was to try and calculate CDA, and uh, for for best bike split and me personally, like CDA is so important. And uh, and you mentioned Jim Miller earlier, and and we did a lot of work with him around around Rio Olympics and Kristen Armstrong, uh, trying to fine tune what her real CDA was based on data. Uh, versus what what you were seeing in the wind tunnel, and and it's really interesting that there's all of these devices and none of the devices report that metric the same way, even though they're all dot fit files. Um, so each one kind of reports it in its own little way. WKO five is able to read all of that, but until there's some standard form, uh, and I and I believe Garmin's working working on that. So there's some standard uh, format for it. We're, we're really not going to be able to pull that into training peaks, uh, main application. Um, it's just, it's a support issue where we, we can't handle 17 different ways that, that these, uh, companies are trying to report the same metric. Um, so I, I would say that's, that's kind of an area where, um, there's some growing pains just as the industry, um, and it's no different than it was probably, uh, 15 years ago when, when Derek was saying you had 
SRM files. And it, now it's the same file format, but it's just different ways to record the same data and different kind of field names. Um, gotcha. So I think, yeah, I think that would be one area that, you know, we, we hear a little bit about um, is, oh, well, why can't we um, add these new data fields quickly and, and more rapidly? And, and part, that's part of the reason um, is, is support long term. Support. So how do you decide or what kind of elements have to be in place when you say yes to adding something into training peaks to incorporate it into the kind of the, the main core of what's existing? Um, I d- yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to speak, uh, <laughs> for the whole team, but I, I know we recently added swim heart rate and, and that's one where, um, the format has, has been steady for, for some time and it's standardized and there was enough, uh, there was enough desire in the community for us to, to bring that in. And so we, I believe we released that a few weeks ago, uh, maybe not ideal timing, but it, but it's out there for people that are, that are wanting to upload that. Yeah. Um, Dirk, can you do you have anything to add to? Well, we have, that? as you mentioned, WKO five, and so companies are leveraging that today with innovative new metrics and devices, and they let us know it, it, it's sort of our sandbox where mm-hmm. these companies can innovate and play, and then they can have their own user groups, um, and then they keep you know us, us informed, and we have we you definitely have to see some traction or adoption in the broader scale, if you will, or at least some, some hint of it um, in order to invest in bringing in new metrics into the system. Cause it is such a, a, a big undertaking, if you will, to add new metrics, but what's nice is WKO is the sandbox where anyone can dump that, that data and kind of prove out their, their uh, new technology. Yeah. For, for kind of nerds, uh, that may be listening, um, who might've used MATLAB or Mathematica back in the day, um, <laughs> a couple of math programs. Um, that's the way I kind of look at WKO. Like there, you can do so many things in it. And so once you get the data, I mean, it pulls in data in any format and in the dot fit files, uh, these companies can go in and, and do developer fields and add anything they want and then go in and, and kind of do any kind of, uh, uh, functions off of those, uh, inside of WKO five. So it's, a, it's a really cool platform and tool for, for that kind of, uh, experimentation. Yeah. And to those nerds that really love to geek out, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge WKO five fan, uh, always experimenting and using it, uh, with my athletes in terms of monitoring, forecasting and getting better insights. So, you know, if this little segue does interest you, uh, just Google WKO five and, 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 um, and start reading and learning a little bit more about it. it is, it's a fun little, uh, desktop software that you can um, play around with, as Dirk said, um, like a, like a sandbox, if you will, if you have a lot of data and if you're into this kind of stuff, but um, to kind of turn back to you, Ryan, what, what has been some experiments or some R and D that uh, have really taken off? Like uh, I think I remember the run with how um, experiment that Dirk had talked about in, in one conference. Um, can you give us some updates on kind of what's some of the newest and latest that's really starting to get traction? Sure. Um, so back, back to kind of my background a decade ago, um, yeah. it, it is in, um, I, I went back and did my master's and, and did all but my dissertation and, um, kind of operations research and optimization mathematics. And, my dissertation topic uh, was was kind of around uh, large scheduling models. So how do you how do you kind of optimize and uh, uh, and come up with the schedules that are are basically trying to attain a goal, uh, but at the same time take human factors into account? And so uh, again, little did they know at the time uh, when they bought Best Bike Split, but when when Training Peaks bought Best Bike Split. It was actually in an LLC that had other IP uh, as part of it. So it, it had a company called Optimized Training Labs. Um, and this was, was a company I had started and, uh, with my co-founder, Rich. And it was, it was basically an, an AI uh, triathlon training program. And, and so uh, it was 
it came out of my frustrations of having a job and trying to do my PhD and trying <laughs> to train for triathlon. And it was like, training was not going to be my number one priority, but it was still a priority. And so I wanted to, uh, I had a couple of coaches and I probably should have used training peaks and coach match to get a better coach. Uh, but I had a couple of coaches and, and they just had such a hard time with the schedule that I was like, okay, well I'll, I'll build this AI system to, to, to do it for me. Um, and it ended up working out fairly well. Um, but it never really took off as a product. And, and there's several reasons for that, but, um, a couple of years ago, we decided to to launch an R and D group uh, about two and a half years ago uh, inside of Training Peaks, and part of that was to look out three, you know, two three years, see what was kind of on the horizon in endurance sports, and where we wanted to to focus our our kind of technical capacity, if you will, and so. Out of that, um, we leveraged some of this early work from 2010, 2011 um, to say, how can we do this in a way that isn't, it is, it's the training peaks way. How can we do this the way that training peaks would do it? Meaning that ultimately our whole goal is to connect athletes with the coach, right? We're training peaks, isn't the coach, but we want to connect you with the coach. Um, and so we launched out of out of R and D. We we kind of launched it, our first commercial test product um, with Coach Hal Higdon, uh, who, uh, for those who are not familiar uh, with Hal, um, just Google my first marathon or training for a marathon or whatever. It'll be number one on the Google results. So, um, yeah, Hal Hal Higdon's been around for a long, long time, and his methodology <laughs> has been used by countless runners uh to go from 5k to their first marathon or uh and everywhere in between and um and he's been on training peaks for so long and such a good relationship that when he was ready to to build a new app um it really coincided with the work we were doing in r d um and so our first test was to say hey can we take his methodology his uh personality um and kind of expand his base to, to new athletes that don't really come to training peaks today. Um, and so out of that, uh, which Dirk mentioned at the last, uh, I believe, um, endurance coaching summit that we were doing this test, we launched it right before the endurance coaching summit last year. So September, October of last year, um, in the first nine months, we've had a hundred thousand, over a hundred thousand installs of it. Um, and wow. <laughs> an average rating on both stores of 4.6 plus on the iOS store and, and Android store. And it's really a mobile first solution to a broader audience that we, we just don't really, we don't capture today in training peaks either. They don't feel they're ready for a one-on-one -on -one coach or, or they're looking for this mobile first kind of training solution. Um, and so when you say mobile first, Ryan, is that, like they have this app and it tells them what to do and there's no interaction with, with a coach, but it, it kicks them out a plan of some kind. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. So it, uh, it's still the, the coach personality. It's still, it's still Hal Higdon who's driving the, I guess the, the substance and the personality behind it. So mm -hmm. it's his mm -hmm. methodology, his workouts, his wording, um, his interventions. If you go to get off track, um, or if you go over or under <laughs> what he's recommending, um, but the but the one to one coaching element um, is is not there. Um, what we ultimately see this doing is is really being a conduit to broaden this base of people that are that are getting expert instruction. Um, so it, it's a way to package expert instruction in a different way um, to allow coaches to connect with with scales of athletes that they wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, but a little bit more so than a traditional, just static training plan that, that gets added. Um, that said, the one-to-one -one coach is always, you know, for us, that is always the best option. And so we see this as a funnel to, to pull more people into, into actual coaching. So, uh, once they get a taste for this expert instruction and feedback, um, you know, you start to, you kind of start to get that loop going. And then people want to go to the next level and the next step in that. 
Um, and so that's, that's where we're, we're looking now. Run with Hal was just really a, a, a test bed to say, Hey, are there people out there that are looking for the solution that we don't cover today in training peaks? Um, a good portion of the people that have downloaded, uh, it, almost, well, over 90% of the people that downloaded, uh, run without don't, don't have a training peaks account. And so we see that as an opportunity to, to migrate more people in, into the platform, um, with a more one-to-one -one level. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. That's really cool. So Dirk, who's the next cycling personality that you're going to roll out with? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to test, we have, we're going through like, what's our next product, you know, offering. Yeah. The biggest thing with all of this is it, it, it adapts to the individual. That's really kind of the big secret to all this, which is amazing. It's, it's the next, it's, it's better than a static training plan because it knows you can't swim next Wednesday or you have family vacation or you actually didn't perform today's workout as planned. It's going to adapt and change tomorrow's workout based on your own lifestyle. So we need to need to develop a few more apps just to kind of build that trust in the system, in the engine. And it's really about the engine underneath whereby we can plug and play different coach methodology, uh, methodologies and personalities. And it's, it's not just go do three times, eight minutes today, but it's why, you know, and how should you feel? And that personality of that coach coming through, um, is really, uh, you know, more than half of why athletes choose a particular coach is they connect with them. So it, this isn't just about numbers, but it's also about bringing that personality of the coach, um, you know, front and center. And so we want to empower the coaches. AI is not here to replace them in, in our world. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, should I be getting worried that uh, <laughs> all this cool AI is going to scoop up all the athletes, Derek, or what's, what's going on? Well, you know, eventually <laughs> it's going to all, you know, we want to service this new technology, you know, to all of our coaches within training peaks. It's step-by-step. Step. It's kind of, uh, Ryan, why don't you tell your analogy of you're, you're, you're going to the moon and. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, my son and I were watching, Oh, I've got three sons, but, uh, the oldest and I were watching the SpaceX mission the other day. So I was geeking out about that. Um, but you know, it's, it's run with how I, I kind of equate it to like, you know, the, the first Mercury mission, you know, you're kind of getting up there and you're seeing what's around, but you know, it's, it's not the vehicle that's going to take you where you want to go, right? It's just going to give you a glimpse of it. And so, uh, so with Run With How, that's, that's kind of what, what, how I view it. And with this next, uh, you know, the next applications or the next, the next thing is, is not going to really get us to where we want to be either. Um, but it's going to get us a little further and, and, you know, expand that reach a little bit more. But as Dirk mentioned, I, I want to make sure I preface like everything I say with, like I told, I told Gear and I told Dirk and, and Andy, our, our current CEO, that I wasn't going to go build another AI app or another AI thing if it wasn't done, you know, the training peaks way. And they they were all on board. We have to put the coach first. Like it's about connecting athletes with the coach and, and expanding, you know, allowing those coaches to expand their reach. Uh, beyond what they what they thought you know was possible, and so ultimately the goal is this next application is to get us a little bit further, but with the goal of bringing all this technology, proving it out with these different missions, and then bringing this technology inside of Training Peaks, um, so that any coach that wants to use it, um, whether it's as an assistant coach type of uh, you know type of technology or, or insights or, or some of these other things we're looking at. Um, so that it, that it benefits every coach so that coaches have more time to do actual coaching. Right. So, yeah, no, that's it. That's it. And, and for listeners here, um, I, I'm a huge fan of, as you guys can probably tell, I'm a huge fan of, of tech AI, and I'm a firm believer that the developments in AI is only going to enhance the coach. Now, if, if the coach does, you know, listen and learn, uh, meanwhile, more people are interacting with different technology and they want to sample it before they, you know, take it a step further. So, um, and you know, in my vision, it's, it's like, I'm getting excited as you guys are kind of painting this picture a little bit more on, um, you know, you said an assistant coach or like your coach assist program, like what does that do for the coach, Ryan? Does that 
I mean, it's you got a little robot here that's building training programs as I'm on the phone talking, or like, <laughs> what is it? Yeah, what is I like it? that. Um, <laughs> so, so our big thing, and, and I'm sure Dirk uh, would agree, is that let's let technology do what technology is really good at doing, and then let's let the people do what people are really good at doing. And so, uh, like in my mind, you know, is scheduling is, is a big thing, right? Trying to keep track of an athlete's schedule, keep track of when they can go to, you know, when they might have master's swim or when they have access to a track or, or when they can get to the weight room, if we can ever get back to a weight room. You know, those, those kind of things, like uh, Google does a really good job of telling me I have a podcast at two o'clock on, uh, you know, on a Wednesday, but if somebody had asked me yesterday when it was, I might not have known. Right. And so <laughs> let's, let's let computers do the heavy lifting around, um, around scheduling, around keeping track of you know, athletes availability, um, around tracking the metrics and trends. Um, so where a coach might set up what trends you really care about, um, whether it's sleep or whether it's HRV or whether it's these other things, let the, let the computer alert you uh, when those things start to look amiss, right? Um, and and so those are the kind of things that that I think we we really want to focus on uh, in terms of the tech side of things uh, and allow a coach to to really spend your time doing the the stuff that a computer can't do, right? Yep, yep, that's it. And, and Ryan, I mean, this this may be a, a rabbit hole we can't get out of, but like. <laughs> I'll ask the question, how important is data hygiene in that whole <laughs> process? Because if you're letting computers do what they do best, but you got bad impulses going into the system, what does that look like for the coach? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's something we deal with in Best Bike Split a lot, right? I mean, you, you have all these variables, and, um, uh, and I know WKO has to deal with it as well. Um, you're only going to data's only, or I guess the output's only as good as the input, right? And and so mm -hmm. if you have bad data coming in, then you you know bad data is going to come out. Um, and, and so there's going to have to be um, a lot of automation around, uh, as you say, like kind of cleaning that data. And, and that's uh, any optimization, you know, any engineer or any scientist that deals with data um, knows that 90% of the work is is often in the in the cleaning of the data. So um, I think what we have to do is, is really be able to highlight outliers quick and early um, and then alert uh, both the coach and the athlete when something looks, uh, looks amiss, right? Because you don't want to start doing trend data or alerts or, or any kind of real like intervention off of what would be bad data. So. Yeah, no, that that's it for sure. Because as I sit here and, and kind of you know, look at the way I coach, you know, this year with COVID, yes, um, we're recording here in like August of 2020 and COVID is rampant, but I feel like I've done probably the best job this summer of, you know, uh, sitting at the computer or, you know, combing through the Training Peaks program or WKO5 and, and cleaning data and knowing kind of um, who's where, who's, cause it's all more controlled. We're not going to bike races. We're not traveling as much. So I was like, oh, I'm on top of it this year. But <laughs> at the same time, it's like, it's cause it's a lot easier, but it's not going to be that way for, for a while, you know? And, and meanwhile, I still definitely am not doing it perfectly. And, and my athletes are crazy and always, you know, changing and going different places. So, uh, that data hygiene is important. But how about, uh, just off the cuff again, how about the communication of like, say, scheduling, meaning, hey, I'm going to uh, go up to Breckenridge instead of stay on the front range to do training um, this weekend. How would something like AI be able to handle that? And that, I mean, could go to Ryan or, or Dirk in that matter from an AI perspective. Ryan? Okay. Um, so right now we, we do, uh, we're working some stuff inside of Training Peaks actually um around uh the coach themselves i mean the athletes themselves being able to to update uh some of this around availability and around uh uh scheduling um i do think in the future um you know they'll <laughs> if we talk about the distant future the things i get excited about you know being able to sync different calendars and things would be would be you know ideal so that you can kind of pick and pick those things out um but but in the meantime, you know, I do think that we have to 
to put a little bit of that on the athlete themselves to, to say, Hey, well, you know, if you got to let your coach know, but let's, let's make sure that we have the tools available for you um, so that it can be done inside of training peaks. Right. So that the athlete can indicate it and then you can, you can, can see their full kind of uh, uh, picture within the application without having to go to two different things or respond to five different emails or get two texts and an email and a Google calendar or what, you know, all, all these different things today, let's, let's kind of uh, have one source of record for, for training, uh, which is training peaks. Yeah. And I, I can see this coach assistant, obviously being coach facing um, obviously at first and whereby the coach is either accepting, denying, or editing what is being planned or scheduled. Um, so at the end of the day, it is the coach making decision, but this assistant is actually making suggestions along the way that can get refined from all those inputs coming in to make it more and more, um, trustworthy, if you will, by the coach. Um, so definitely, you know, this assistant's going to go through multi, you know, many generations. And, and you guys, uh, have more stuff that I'm in Texas, so we don't have like elevation or things like that to worry about here. Uh, we do have 170, <laughs> 170 degrees heat yeah. to worry about. So. I was just going to say, you guys got heat. <laughs> yeah, we've got the other elevation, right? <laughs> the other hit. Yeah. So, um, you know, things like that, I, I definitely do think, um, you know, down the road as we start to look at, and we started to touch on these in the R&D group uh, before we, we kind of started to spin off our first commercial um, test, uh, was to look at, at how you can start to to recognize uh, those trends in athletes and say, you know, well, how do they perform at altitude, for instance, and and what may what may make sense at, you know, for me at 400 feet, you know, basically sea level. Uh, if I went to Breckenridge, I'm I'm not going to be going and doing the same workout, right? And so, uh, at least not for several months. Um, so so those kind of things, I think, um, will. We'll continue to do uh, R and D and continue to do uh, kind of data analysis on um, over time and, and start to figure out where we can get the biggest benefit, I guess, um, based on gotcha. our data. I like that. I like that a lot. So we're we're talking a lot about where Training Peaks is going, uh, Derek. I'll, I'll turn back to you. Kind of in the short and medium term. Um, over the next, I don't know, one to two years. I mean, where do you see the vision of the company going and, and what's the overall goal here? I mean, we've heard a lot from our customer base in terms of the the folks that are coming to our homepage for the first time ever and what are they look, looking for. And we know we can do a better job of connecting them to the expert instruction that they came to the site for. You know, historically, Training Peaks was, you know, thought of as software. And we're we're now seeing ourselves as, yeah, we, we have software, but actually we lead with a marketplace because the majority of the people that hear about Training Peaks and decide to go venture to our homepage and create an account, they're actually looking for expert instruction. They're not looking for software. And having that realization is kind of an aha moment. It's a big deal in our in our evolution. And so our teams are now really honing on honing in on, okay, let's find out what type of coaching this individual is looking for. Are they looking for a training plan? Are they looking for, you know, one-to-one coaching? What price point? Aha. Well, a lot of them are telling us they want something better than a training, than a training plan, which is just static, but yet they're not quite ready to pay the $300 a month or whatever it might be for a premium coaching service. So there's a lot of opportunity there and a lot of demand for us to to fill that void. And we have coaches obviously that want to fill that void, um, but we can do a better job of making those connections happen. So we have a coach match program. We obviously have our training plan store, um, but we need to figure out a better way of serving up these new offerings to the right person at the right time. So that's certainly in our more mid range plan is it just take advantage of all the opportunity we have um, every single day today and helping these athletes find the right services that they're, that they're looking for. So that's probably a, a big focus of ours right now. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're talking about scaling athletes as well as, as scaling coaches. And well, yeah, we certainly, we have a lot of demand right now on the, on the, you know, from the athlete side. Um, we have coaches that can provide those services, but kind of teasing out from the athlete, what are they really looking for mm -hmm. and connecting them with the right coach, um, is a big opportunity. Yeah. yeah I, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, go, go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. I, I was just going to add, you know, we kind of was given a presentation the other day and one of the things I, I kind of like, you know, like to focus in on is that as a company, I mean, we, we really do believe and, and we strive every day to, to, to live this, that every single athlete deserves great coaching, right? Like that's how they're going to get to be the best athlete that they can be, whether that's finishing, just getting to getting to the starting line in some cases or, or getting to the world championship, right? Every single athlete deserves great coaching. Now, in, and I'd add to that, that, you know, every, we should, provide tools and technology and services so that every coach can be as successful as they want to be as well. And so right now, as Dirk mentioned, we, we kind of have this gap where, where, you know, we have athletes coming in and we, we have, we have services and we have coaching, but, but there's something that's missing that, that they're telling us that they need something in between. And so that's something that we're, we're looking to, to build upon, um, but we're doing it with our coaches, you know, not in spite of our coaches. And I think that's, that's an important thing is that we, we really do feel that every coach should, should be as successful as they want to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that Ryan. And what kind of both of you has said is, you know, kind of putting the coach first. I really appreciate that. And I've spoken with some of my colleagues in terms of uh, having a product that's in between say the athlete and the coach. I'm personally a huge fan of that because it actually helps the athlete to learn and develop more so that when they're ready for the coach, they're up to speed much, much more quickly. Meaning I have to kind of essentially do less or I can be more creative and focus on what actually matters as opposed to the very uh, basics of education, mechanics, uploading, um, how this device works. Um, oh, why can't I push for 20 minutes? All this kind of thing where a refined athlete, when they come to a coach, now it gets more creative. And so from that standpoint, I think this is wonderful. And then the other thing I was going to say is, at that point as well, when somebody has practiced or, you know, trained up to a point where, uh, they need more of an expert, you know, instructor, that coach athlete relationship will only be much better if the athlete's more proficient, but also if they're, uh, like communication and kind of core principles, methodologies, thought process, communication styles align in, in, um, Dirk, we, we talked about that on, on another podcast with one of my athletes and, and when that mashes up well, that's when success can occur. And that's what you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what you guys are also trying to optimize through AI and kind of the core bread and butter of what you're offering already. Yeah, exactly. I mean, every coach is unique to have their own kind of methodologies, terminologies that need to be communicated and then understood and educated, you know, to the athlete as you're alluding to. Um, likewise, you know, if an athlete needs to kind of back off some services, you know, if they mm -hmm. put a lot of intense training into this year, their big A race is over, they need to take downtime. Hey coach, I think I need like you know, four months, but I really want to have more of a maintenance program. Um, can, can I have a lower level service, you know, offering, um, boom, you know, you, you can have that as well to help bridge the gap. So they just don't leave you all together, but you can then, when they're ready to come back, you now have all, have all that collected data. You can see what was planned for them, how they reacted to it. And are they truly ready to get back on board, you know, with a, another serious, um, you know, schedule. So it kind of goes both ways as well. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. So as, so that's kind of in the short term, can we go longer term and yep. <laughs> kind of tease out? <laughs> so Derek, if we are talking like how long term can, can we go here? Well, I think we've been talking about a lot of it right now. We, we don't really yeah. have that per se roadmap to the exact you know, month, a year, et cetera. It's all has to kind of take on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. uh, we learn as we go. We don't know the pitfalls ahead of us. 
So we'll learn, adapt. We're always going to be pushing forward. Um, so again, it's about bringing that technology to all coaches, but yet coaches don't have to use it. You know, if a coach wants to have five athletes and they want to review every single file and they don't want any interventions or any kind of AI, that's completely fine. Just as we have coaches today that have never written a training plan. They have never sold a training plan. They never want to. On the other other side of the spectrum as well, we have co- we have coaches that have never really done one to one coaching. They just sell training plans, but they are are big authors like you know Hal Higdon. Um, you know, so it allows the coach to build a business in the vision that they have for themselves and their business, and and to be able to leverage these different offerings within our ecosystem and, and suite of products. Okay, so from that longer term perspective, Dirk, uh, just curious. I want to kind of push into this. What is what is the biggest op- or the biggest challenge right now at Training Peaks that you see? Well, at the end of the day, we are a software company. We don't employ coaches. Um, you know, we develop software. So certainly, in this day and age of high tech, and the you know in, in, in this world we live in, it's it's a challenging time to to hire. There's a lot of great talent out there, but a lot of great companies, you know, and we are literally, you know, um, competing with Facebook and Google. Um, and Google has probably 2,500 staff right here, you know, a mile from my house. So, uh, you know, that's probably the biggest challenge in terms of the business side of things is, Mm -hmm. you know, we're hiring right now. We're always hiring. We always, you know, we've always had a budget, you know, to be hiring more folks. It just takes longer than, than we like. Um, because the competition is so high out there, um, for, for developers and QA and, and everything else. So that's probably the biggest challenge we face, um, as, as a business, which is kind of good in a way, you know, we're in a strong, we're in a strong, um, you know, I, I guess domain, if you will, you know, software is a, is a, is a very good industry obviously to be in it's growing, we don't know what the future looks like and there's ever more dollars coming in and more, more, you know, power, um, to do better and better things. It's really, really exciting. That's, what's awesome too, about being in this world and, and, you know, being within training peaks and the software industry is it does kind of feel like a startup every single year. You're, you're, you, you know, you're always envisioning, you know, the product we envision is five years out in our heads and we need, you know, 10 more developers like yesterday. Um, that's always the conversation we're having, right? Um, so that's probably the biggest challenge, you know, we're facing. Well, I was just going to ask, what is the biggest opportunity? And I mean, you may have already answered that, but uh, feel free to yeah. build on it. No, I think our biggest opportunity is to convince people that they are deserving of coaching. A lot of people That's feel good. that yeah. it's intimidating. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I'm only here to finish or I'm doing my, you know, I only want to break an hour for the, you know, 10 K. I mean, everybody deserves that expert instruction and that some level of coaching, which can make, even if you're training five hours a week, you can make that five hours of much more valuable than just trying to figure it out on your own and just haphazardly training. So literally we want to bring a coach to every single endurance athlete in the world, no matter where they live or what technology or what interface they want to have, or if it's in person, you know, that, that we're also all about in-person coaching as well, you know? Um, so I think that's our biggest opportunity is, you know, we've, you know, it's top down, it's, you know, started at the Olympic level, Ironman level, um, now people are starting to realize, Hey, I am worth it. You know, I, and it, it doesn't have to be crazy expensive to get great expert advice for your next event. So that's, that's a great opportunity for coaches, obviously as well. This is so much more opportunity out there. Yeah. And I think having the AI will help people to realize they are worthy as, as you say, or that, Hey, this, you know, this actually works and it, it applies to me. It actually benefits me. And then you can, you know, they can take it, uh, to whatever level they want from there, which is super fun. Yeah. I mean, the mainstay of probably our customer base, you know, train eight to 12 hours a week, 
you know, obviously family job, but they have high ambitions for whatever event it might be. Um, and so, you know, we can help them make the most of those 10 or 12 hours that they have a week. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Well, Ryan and Dirk, we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour. And I always like to end each episode with a few takeaways or questions to the guests. And those, the answers usually uh, try to summarize what we've talked about, hit on some key points, or just give the listeners a, a few nuggets that they can take away and think about or apply to their training. So uh, if you guys are ready, let's do this. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, question number one. And this goes to uh, each of you, and I'll ask Ryan first. What's one thing you didn't see coming along this journey at Training Peaks? Oh man, <laughs> I did. I didn't even see Training Peaks coming, uh, honestly. <laughs> so, um, oh, there's so many things that I that I never saw coming. And in, in, but the biggest one is, is uh, you rarely get a chance, uh, and in my case, you rarely get a chance to to do something a second time the right way, you know, um, mm -hmm. we talk about failing or we, we talk about failing fast and, and those kind of things. But, you know, when I tried to go down this route a decade ago, it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right place. It wasn't the right way to go about it. And now we have a chance to do it. And, and I don't think there's any other company uh, besides training peaks where, where it makes sense. And so, um, I'm, I think that's what I didn't see coming, uh, when I started back in 2014. So, uh, I'm really excited about the direction that we're, we're starting to head. So nice. And, and Dirk, uh, question to you, what, what didn't you see coming along your journey? I always hated training indoors on the turbo trainer and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that whole world is now completely different from the eighties when I sat, you know, on my turbo trainer, yeah. um, that virtual, it's not just training. It's that virtual community, the virtual racing. There's now more race days done indoor virtually than there are outdoors. And that's, that's only happened in the last year. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's a Even big with wave. with the pandemic going on. So. <laughs> yeah, the pandemic kind of, in a way, I feel squished several years worth of innovation or not even innovation, just like the dynamics of the marketplace would be the same, but it would have taken a couple more years. I think it so, forced it out quicker. Right. No, and no. there's many other instances of that in other industries where what was inevitable that may have taken a few years is now here now and it only took three months um yeah. you know virtual racing was coming virtual e you know I, i've been watching you know formula one you know simulated races on monaco grand prix and it's pretty darn cool to watch on TV, even though it's all <laughs> fake, um, you know, and the best driver still wins, um, in, you know, different things to deal with in, within virtual racing, but it's, it's a different, it's a different type of racing. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, so I didn't see that coming, but yet it was inevitable. And so these things are just coming at us faster than we could have ever thought. There's also industries that haven't survived or we'll have a very difficult time surviving because of this epidemic as well. So obviously I didn't see that coming, but on the bright side, you know, it, it accelerated virtual racing, virtual training. That's all great. You know, different, there's different winners of the E tour de France than there are of the real tour de France. Right. 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 That's it. Okay. Question two, we'll go back to Ryan and then to Dirk. Uh, what is the biggest challenge in your view to the endurance athlete out there? So people listening, people out there training, uh, the, the nine to fivers, the professional athlete, but to the endurance athlete, what's the biggest challenge, Ryan? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> right now I, I think it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of un uncertainty, but as, as we kind of, you know, hopefully start to get back, back to some, some nor normalness, um, you know, I, I still think it's, it's juggling priorities. Like the, the elite, like, you know, kind of point of the spear people and the people that have like training is their number one priority. Um, I, I think they're, 
they're going to continue kind of doing what they do and performing at a high level. I think it's the, you know, the people like myself that are juggling a family and a job and trying to train and, and just a busy life and, and really trying to, to fit everything in and, and set those priorities that may change throughout the year. Um, you know, I think that's, that's the area that, you know, uh, I, I believe is, is kind of that, <laughs> that, that area that, that we all sh- struggle with a little bit and, and hopefully there's an opportunity for training peaks to, to help with that as well. So. Agreed. Agreed. Derek, what do you think the biggest challenge is for an endurance athlete out there? You know, there's no one formula of success that works. Um, it's yeah. really the individualization of that training, which is the challenge. And, you know, it. you know, having that expert, um, I guess, coach or somebody else to, to work with, to kind of go through all the decision-making processes and what takes a higher priority, maybe as, as Ryan is alluding to, to decide on what to do tomorrow. It's different for every single person. Even if you're, you weigh the same, you have the same strengths and weaknesses and you're training for the same race, you know, two individuals are going to adapt differently. Um, you know, and I have a sore back today. What should I do tomorrow? Which is totally true and legit is my story right now. Um, (laughs) so what should I do tomorrow? You know, and it's this, this, you know, I'm taking up running now in the fall and it's, I'm not adapting the same as what I have in the past. So how long is this going to take me? So it's, I guess the challenge is just realizing that, you know, every person is unique, um, and adapts differently and figuring out your own kind of secret, um, formula is really the biggest challenge. Got it. Okay, final questions for each of you, and they're slightly different. So, so listen up, Ryan. Uh, we'll go to you first. Where do you see the endurance coach in ten to fifteen years from now, in terms of how they monitor data, uh, develop training strategies, and interact with the athlete? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think one to one coaching is is always going to be the gold standard, right? So. I do think that, uh, you know, there's still going to be, uh, a lot of, uh, the one-to-one nuanced coaching where everything Dirk just mentioned about, you know, the individual nature of, of athletes and their responses. But I do hope, uh, that, you know, you, you mentioned earlier <laughs> cleaning of data and all these kind of things. I do hope that we get to a point where, you know, there's, there's less of that needed. So whether it's through an assistant coach uh, type technology that, that training peaks will develop or, um, you know, the, the devices themselves getting better over time. Um, I, I do think that, that we'll start to see more and more. Um, I mean, I look at my, my three kids and, you know, you see how much technology they, they interact with, uh, unfortunately way too much right now, <laughs> um, on a day-to-day basis. Um, but you know, 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago, when we look at what we had, you know, dirt, dirt, they were, they were starting with, you know, some kind of beginnings of the internet, right? Like 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, we've come a long way, but there's so much more that, that we can, that we can gain out of it. So, uh, I, I think the coach, um, there's always going to be the one-to-one coach, but you know, you will be able to, to scale, um, your, your methodology, your personality as, as much as you want. So as Dirk mentioned before, um, you may have a broad funnel of athletes that are, that are kind of, you know, not ready to step up for that one-to-one, but they're still kind of using, uh, you know, your training mechanisms. And, and so when they are ready to step up, they're already, you know, I don't want to say groomed, but they're already used to the terminology. They're already used to the type of data you want to look at. They're used to the things that you want, you know, that you care about in terms of metrics. So um, I really think that, that coaching, uh, you know, is, is um, going to get more tailored to the individual uh, than it even, than it is even today. And that a lot of the, um, I don't want to say busy work, but a lot of the work that, that you have to get through to get to the coaching will hopefully be, will be, you know, fully or, or partially automated. I would, I would greatly appreciate that, Ryan. So you, just, <laughs> you keep working away on that. Right. <laughs> uh, Dirk, final question to bring us home. Uh, where do you see the endurance athlete? 
how they train, how they live, and how they monitor their data and take care of themselves from in 10 to 15 years from now? Well, I think one constant that will be the same as today is the importance of just how you feel. I mean, we've been talking a lot about numbers and automation and AI, et cetera, but you can't automate how the athlete feels and how their mood is today, right? So that rate of perceived exertion, you know, hopefully we can take advantage of that input more in the future and actually allocate for it more in terms of the decision making. But certainly, you know, we're we're not going away from, you know, ha- how the athlete feels, and that's so 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 important. But maybe we can a- a- account for it more in the future. Um, we'll certainly have more. I, I I hope the endurance athlete and coach are just simply smarter because of technology um, that these apps are bringing to the surface insights that they didn't maybe think of or previously know about or see in the data and the correlations between training routines and what is developing, you know, what does that trend look like? Um, so I hope, you know, the endurance athlete is, is smarter in the future and can make better decisions on what to do today or tomorrow based upon all the inputs coming in. Um, but I, I still feel all, you know, there's all, you know, having, a personal um, experience coach is still going to be the best way to go in the future, but hopefully they're just smarter because of, of the technology. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Well, guys, thank you both for taking time out of your busy days to uh, connect with us on the Train Ride podcast. If if listeners really enjoyed the conversation, they want to follow each of you on social media. Where can they find you, Ryan? Well, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> As I was looking, I couldn't. We find don't you. let him. Yeah, know, we, we don't let, him we don't let me out very much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you can. You can. Um, oh man, yeah. I guess uh, you can find me on Facebook or uh, or you know just follow Best Bike Split on Twitter. Um, so I cool. still still man that occasionally. So gotcha. And Dirk, if they want to follow you at the high altitude adventures in the winter time, and uh, where can they find you on the socials? Absolutely. In Instagram, just Dirk Freel at, cool. uh, you know, at, on Instagram, I, I tend to rarely go to Twitter or Facebook. So in, Instagram is really simple for me. <laughs> Got it. Got it. And of course, everybody uh, that is curious can follow uh, Training Peaks at, at Training Peaks on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, and check out our show notes for a little bit more content as well. So thank you guys again, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Adam. Thank you.